My name is Jeffy. I'm upstairs in the reference department, and it's been my pleasure this year to be coordinating with the Alzheimer's Association to offer this program series on Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, I have over on the table some books from the library on the topics of Alzheimer's, caregiving, d different dementias as well as since today's topic is hospice and versus palliative care, I put a couple of books about uh, what we had on the shelf for Medicare and making some of these decisions and checklists for caregivers. So we also have some memory kits that we started circulating that were provided to the library via a grant with the Alzheimer's Association. They live on a shelf just past the uh, circulation desk and they, you can check them out and use them to trigger conversations and have some things to do with your loved ones. We have free snacks and water on the back table and some information from the Alzheimer's Association. There's a flyer about our caregivers group that meets once a month here and about the upcoming next two programs. There are brochures in September. We'll have the home safety one. Um, I apologize for the glass in our meeting room. Every, everybody sees they were worried. They put tons of signs on them saying, please don't touch. We're making study rooms. There's going to be one on the first floor and then two upstairs. So people will have little private areas for groups of five or less. It's like, finally. <laughs> um, but right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Julie, Julie Ehrlich, who's going to talk to us about the differences between hospice and palliative care. She has generously donated her time to speak over previous years, and I look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I need my notes, don't I? Thank you all for letting me come again. I do recognize a few faces here today. I guess my memory's not too bad from last year, huh? <laughs> So, but I thank you all for letting me come and speak. Um, in my daytime job, I'm a care manager. So I help folks out in the community. I work for Arosa Care and I help folks in the community with managing their medical care, advocating out there in this world and going through different journeys, whatever that medical condition may be. So I have seen quite a bit in my last 25 to 30 years being in this type of field. So today's topic I was asked to speak about is near and dear to my heart because I have seen family members go through this. I've seen patients go through this. My own parents go through this. And I want to share not only the hospice aspect, but palliative care. What does that mean? Palliative care is what hospice does, but palliative care you can get without being on hospice. I'm like, what does that mean? So I wanted to kind of clarify to everyone and make sure everyone understands what you can get for yourself, for your loved one, for your friends. So first of all, who in this room has either had someone in your family use hospice care in the course of your time? Now, what about palliative care? If so, anyone use palliative care? Okay. So educating ourselves about both of these services is extremely important. Empowering yourself about any disease process and what you can do to better yourselves and your quality of life is essential, in my opinion. And I think will help all of us to live a better life, whatever that may look like. Speaking to your doctors, your specialists, and being completely honest about those symptoms. I know it's difficult. It's sometimes difficult as a loved one to speak about what's going on in your life and what's going on with your illness, but that is going to help you ultimately with your quality of life with this illness, whatever it may be. So first of all, I wanted to talk about palliative care. So this is a patient-centered type treatment and it focuses on improving symptom and pain management for patients with serious illnesses. But the difference, and we'll get into more differences with hospice, is it is curative. When you think about hospice, that's more end-of-life care. 
palliative care, we're talking about curative. So they have multidisciplinary team members. They have physical therapy. They have specialists. They have doctors, dietitians, counselors who all work together based on the person's needs and their level of care, depending on whatever that illness is, that terminal illness or that chronic illness, whatever that may be, to provide the medical social or emotional type support for that person. Now, these conditions could be COPD, they could be dementia, they could be Parkinson's, they could be heart failure. Um, it, it just, it doesn't matter. I mean, palliative care can come into the place as soon as you've been diagnosed with a certain type of illness. You can ask your doctor about this. It is a multidisciplinary team, so it, it involves all different types. Now we go into hospice, and please, if anybody has questions as I go along, I am not offended, please raise your hand and we will go into this. But I'm trying to kind of show you there is a difference between the two of them. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. So, you know, like for this is what I'm going to give examples of right now with palliative care. So, for example, if a patient has lung cancer and the doctor says in part of the treatment, we're going to remove part of the, the lung or colon cancer. We need to remove part of the, the cancer. That's curative type part of the cancer treatment or part of the treatment. But palliative care is treating the symptoms. If they have chemotherapy, they're treating the symptoms. So you're continuing to have, if you have injections that are being done, if you're having chemotherapy, if you're having radiation, that is called curative treatment. If you're on hospice, you are not receiving curative treatment. It is, it is a type of palliative care, but it's your end of life. You're gearing towards end of life. Palliative care is dealing with the symptom management. So when, like, for example, with a patient who I've had numerous patients, but I'm thinking of one who did have colon cancer and they had part of the colon removed. So palliative care took care of the incision pain, took care of the radiation afterwards, the symptoms, appetite loss, um, nausea, constipation, though all of those are under palliative care. So their doctor would treat all of those symptoms. So that's what that falls under. Um, for example, mental health, they, mental health could be understandably part of that. They could hook them up with a counselor because their whole life has changed, understandably. So palliative care can address those type of things. Um, let's see. Another one, I have actually have had a patient with this with breast cancer who has, un, you, if you've been through this with patients, you understand. Their white counts go down, They're, they become severely anemic, and so they may need blood transfusions or they may need IV transfusions, and so therefore that is considered palliative. They can continue getting their chemo, they can continue having, if they need to have like a lumpectomy or they need to have different treatments, they, that is curative. They continue to have the curative treatment, but they're also getting that palliative care team to continue to have someone taking care of the symptoms, the pain, the, you know, any kind of, any kind of symptom that would be causing them any discomfort. Does that help answer some of your questions? Okay. There's a lot to it, <laughs> but I mean, that's why I'm trying to get everyone to understand that this service is out there. Um, and it's, it's important to, to talk about this. So the next thing I have up is regarding hospice. So I wanted to talk a little bit about hospice because of where, you know, just the history of hospice. It is a Latin word. No, I did not take Latin, but it does come from Latin word hospit hospitium, which means guest house, um, which is a term originally used for a place of shelter for weary and sick travelers. Um, so over time, it was referring to keeping people safe and in a safe place to keep them comfortable. So that's where that word came from. And hence the concept of hospice was born. This was pre 
20th century that that whole term came about. But of course, if you look back, if any of you are familiar with Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, back talking back in the 60s, that's when the whole term of hospice came about, when this whole term of um, better home care, better end of life care, that is when this whole thing came about in hospice care. And then in the 80s, in 1986, is when Medicare, the coverage for hospice care came about in 1986. So a little history there for you about hospice and why this has been such a drive. If any of you have ever read Kubler-Ross's On Death and Dying, I don't know if any of you have had that history. I have a degree in gerontology, so that's why I'm talking about this, but I'm very passionate about that and the importance of quality of life for all of us um, and talking about these things is so important. So hospice, again, it sounds similar to palliative care, but again, we're talking about, we're not doing curative treatment now. Form of care designed to provide comfort and support patients and their families when a terminal illness is no longer responding to medical curative treatment. The goal is to improve the quality of life with comfort and dignity. Again, they have a specialized medical care team. For those of you who have worked with hospice, you know this. They have nurses, they have caregivers, physicians who are trained with end of life care, chaplains, volunteers, mental health providers, as other staff that can come in and provide care in the home, wherever they may be, to provide that pain and symptom management. But it's geared towards end of life care, depending on whatever that diagnosis may be, whatever that terminal illness may be. If we're talking lung cancer, heart failure, dementia, whatever that may be, they are trained to look at that. Their nurses are trained to talk to families. And yes, families are a part of this service. You receive that support. You receive that love and care and understanding. And again, like I said, the hospice team are trained in understanding the progression and knowledge. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? I know I'm talking, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. So what is the curative treatment for dementia? Good question. They're working on that. <laughs> Alzheimer's Association, as you know, they're doing research to try to find different, different medications to help. I mean, at this point, there are no... So they can go right into hospice if they're diagnosed? No, they cannot go directly into hospice if you're diagnosed with dementia palliative care. So for example, if someone is experiencing, I had a gentleman reach out to me recently. I do support groups in the community. I had a person reach out to, reach out to me recently. His wife is exhibiting some behavioral challenges and things like that. So I can't say that they would immediately go to palliative care, but this is something you discuss with your doctor. When is the right time to reach out to palliative care? When the symptoms of, you know, pain, um, which as a dementia person, if you've taken care of a dementia loved one, you know they can't always verbalize pain. They could be in pain. They could be having you know, something going on in the body that you're not aware of, and they exhibit it by having verbal outbursts or agitation or um, not wanting to get dressed, not wanting to do these, di these different things. And so therefore, palliative care is something to bring up. You don't automatically go into hospice. Hospice is more when you're talking about dementia patients, that is when things have broken down where you, they are not able to care for themselves any longer. They're not, things are shutting down where you're having difficulty with swallowing, you're having trouble with eating. Things are breaking down where you're not able to do things for yourself. And we're getting towards the latter stages of the disease process, those type of things. So, but I'm bringing up this palliative care process because it's so important to talk to your doctor about symptom management, pain management. And with dementia, it's like I just said, you have to be a detective to know what's going on with them a lot of times because they're not able to verbalize to you what is happening. Or if they do verbalize, it may not be exactly what is going on. There may be something underlying that is happening. Did I help kind of, I know it's hard to <laughs> dementia. Yes. That's what I'm getting into. Yes. Yes. So the similarities for hospice and palliative care, you can receive these types of care in the following settings in your home, assisted living, nursing homes, hospital, 
in a clinic, in a group home. So pretty much anywhere, anywhere you are. Um, you can go to them. They can come to you. Um, that's not a problem. It is for all ages. It doesn't matter. There are children receiving palliative care. There are children receiving hospice. There are over 100-year-old people receiving. It doesn't matter what age you are. There's no limitation. Um, Medicare, your question. Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurances cover services. Veterans, you need to check with your Department of VA for palliative care benefits. Hospice covers that as well. Always check with your insurance to, you know, making sure everything is covered, but there is a, there is coverage for, for these type of services. Um, it is essential. I mean, I, I, there's no doubt. I mean, I remember with my parents, when I knew that they needed this type of care, you know, my sister's like, oh, insurance won't cover that. I said, yes, they will. <laughs> I said, we need to, she's like, well, I don't know about his supplement. You know, you need to check your insurance, see what you have. If you have questions, that's okay. Go and talk to someone. And if you have questions about that. Symptom management, this is the similarities, will be addressed for each type of care. Their nausea, these are just a few. There's, I know there are so many symptoms out there. Pain, nausea, shortness of breath, mental health concerns, um, behaviors. I mean, there's so many different things that come about. Appetite loss. Um, with dementia, if you're talking about dementia, they don't understand as they progress through the disease process towards the end, they don't comprehend the need to eat. They don't understand I'm supposed to eat. They don't comprehend how to chew, how to swallow. That's what happens as we progress towards hospice and the need for that. So these are things that need to be addressed. And what do we do? What do I do? You know, and that's why these specialists are there to help you. Each patient has their own vision. Each individual is unique and each suffering is unique. Now, going back to palliative care again, think people may recover and move out of palliative care. It depends on their disease process. I mean, you could be diagnosed, and I mean, I have, my family members have had cancer. Um, they've gone through treatment. They had palliative care for their symptoms, for pain, and they got better. They're in remission. They're doing better. They didn't need it any longer. Things, have, things happen like that. Chronic illnesses, you need them when you need them or you back off and say, I'm okay right now. They'll check in with you and you can come back with it. So you can move in and out as needs arise. They can receive treatments to cure illness ongoing by managing the symptoms. This is what I was talking about for curative treatment. You can continue getting treatment Patients can receive palliative treatment as part of symptom management of curative treatment, such as IV fluids. I talked about this before. IV fluids, blood transfusions, um, any of those type of things to help them. Home health services. I get this question, too, because I had a lady that went on palliative care, and she said, oh, my, I want my PT to still come, and I want my home health nurse to still come. And I said, they could still come because she still wants to get up, and she still wants to do therapy, and she still wants her nurse to come. And I said, that's fine. Nothing changes. This is, we're addressing your pain and your discomfort and your, like she's appetite problems and, you know, addressing all of this, and making sure you're taken care of. But yeah, you're still, because that is built differently. The home health piece is built differently. So that does not stop. They can continue doing that. Does anybody have questions about any of that? I know I'm talking a lot. You go, she had her hand up first. I'm sorry. What kind of sort are you going to cover? What kind of services hospice would offer you or palliative care would offer you in the way of nurses? Or mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I can explain that. Yes. Yes, sir. My wife is suffering with Alzheimer's dementia and she is living in a memory support unit. And <clears throat> I'm hearing, I'm, I'm listening to you, and I understand how you're identifying palliative care as a specific, but it seems to me that by taking her to various doctors, uh, the services that she's getting at the memory support unit, so that's palliative care in my understanding. 
No, it's it's different. I mean, yeah, because these people are specialized specifically. For example, I have a lady right now that I, I'm a care manager, so I, I have a lady right now who sees a palliative care doctor. She is specialized for chronic illness, chronic diseases. That is all she does. And so her team, that is all they do. They are looking only at, you know, how are things going with your disease progression, but also how are things with everything else with, because she does have other special specialists regarding like cardiology and all those other things, but she's looking at what else is going on with you, like your legs, what is happening, because you know, she's got edema and things like that. We're looking at every symptom holistically. They're looking at the entire body as it relates to that person in that disease, if that makes sense. That's their specialty. When you're going to all these other, other different specialists, they, there are several different specialists. You're not going to one specific person and their team. These people are specialists in that type of field. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. I'm a father Pong. Father Pong, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like with palliative care, if you get into palliative care, are you then going with their doctors and nurses? Not necessarily, no. I know in hospice, they take charge. Not necessarily. For either side of that no no you so like for example i was just talking about this lady she she sees this palliative care doctor she still sees her other doctors okay. it's an addition and they all communicate mm -hmm. so the palliative care doctor can manage the pain management piece or this you know if they're having nausea they can they decide between them and the primary care what they want to do they figure that out communication is key when it comes to hospice, and I, I'll get into that, the patient has a decision whether they want to keep their primary care doctor or not. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, the hospice doctor is an end-of-life care specialist. And so they have that expertise to give to that family and explain where we're at. So it's, it's important to have them, like, on your hip, like, to, to have them on your team. And I'm not saying because people are like, I don't want to get rid of my doctor. I've had them 40 years. And I was like, it's okay. You can keep them. But I, I also recommend you, because what they do in hospice is they have an IDT, a team meeting every week, and they all meet as a team and they discuss these patients. And they are specialists in that field and understanding what's going on with their team. But we also want to hear from your doctor who's known you forever. They know you very well. So it, you don't necessarily need to give up your doctor. I mean, they don't take over. I mean, they... They, they're very good about that. Yes, ma'am. So you would go to your primary and ask about palliative care? Right? Yes, I'm going to get into that. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm going to get into that. Yep. All right, yes. Uh, my mother's on hospice care with advanced dementia, and we just found out, like, today that they had taken her off of Namzera. Okay. I'm, like, questioning whether that's appropriate or not. I can't answer to your yeah. mom as well, to why. Yeah. Yeah. Specifically in my situation, but yeah. I just wondered if that's a normal standard of care for someone in her situation. It depends on the situation. I'll, I'll get down into this uh, later, but typically, you know, it depends on the situation. I can't speak for your mom's situation, but they come up with a plan of care with the family and review what's going on with them and decide with the family as to what medications are necessary for their care and what are not, but before they are taken off any medicines, they should discuss that with you. I can't speak for them. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Okay, let me move on. Thank you for the questions though. I love throwing things at me. It makes my brain work, thank you. <laughs> um, let's see, now going into hospice, um, let me see, but I wanna back up real quick because I had notes here and you all like threw me off with all the questions, but um, so palliative care though, I do want to say um, real quick, they are, I, I did some more research about that because, and I, and I probed the palliative care doctor a little bit asking her questions when I was there. They are teaching this more in the medical schools, um, which I was glad to hear, like talking to the med students about this. So I'm curious how that's going to affect 
when some of you go to the doctor in the next 10 years, like, are they talking more about this now? So I'm glad to hear that they are talking about palliative care. And so when people are diagnosed with chronic illnesses and diseases, if they are gonna bring up the subject of, let's get on your chronic pain, let's get on understanding your disease process and get a plan in place because I've heard too many times, unfortunately, where a person is diagnosed with any kind of chronic disease, dementia, Parkinson's, whatever, and they're not given a plan of action. So I'm hoping, I'm trying to have hope here with that. <laughs> I just wanna say that. Um, so let's look at hospice here. So a patient qualifies for hospice care if their physician feels that they have less than six months to live, should the disease take its usual course. So they don't have a magic ball that tells them, okay, you know, we're six months away. However, they look at the, the diagnosis, they look at the symptoms, they look at the patient, and they, they speculate that it could be six months or less. Now, the way that Medicare works, they do a certification period where they assess the patient. I think it's 90 days now is what they do for periods to reassess and then they recert again in 90 days. So basically they have to recertify to make sure they still qualify. Some people improve and they come off of hospice. Um, but they need to, I mean, we don't know when our loved one's going to go. I mean, my dad was on hospice over a year. I mean, you don't know. He wasn't ready. <laughs> so it's, you just don't know. So always speak to your doctor. Again, I think I've already said this a couple times. Always speak to them about your troubles, your difficulties, um, or if it's about your loved one and you can't say it in the office when you're with them, send a note to your doctor or email them or send it on the portal and say, hey, mom or my husband or my brother or my whomever is, we're having troubles and I really need to talk to you. Um, and I think it might be time to do this, that, or the other. Um, it's so important to communicate. If you can't do it there in, in the office, you feel uncomfortable, then find a time privately to speak to the doctor, whatever you can do. When you're on hospice, you're less likely to have to undergo any tests or have to go out to visits, appointments, or meds that may not be necessary. So we've all possibly been with patients or loved ones that have gone through cancer treatments or have gone through illnesses that have taken a toll on them for many years and have progressed to a point where it's been too much on them. And that's why we've made the decision for them to go on hospice and to have that extra care and support. Um, and that is why we are at that point. So that's why we don't want to do the tests. We don't want to have them go out to doctor's appointments. We want them to just have comfort and peace and then just have the love that they need. So that is when people typically will have that. And I think one of you asked about, she's right there, I think, is it your wife? She asked about hospice and what that looks like. It looks like differently for every person. I can't say what it's like for every person because as I was saying to this lady right here, every person has their own plan of care. When they come see you or you or you, they have a different plan of care because everybody has a different picture, a different identity, a different diagnosis. They come up with a plan of care. They may say, well, my nurse needs to see you twice a week. I'm going to have an aide come and see you twice a week to help you with bathing. You know, it just depends. Or they say, I only need to see you once a week. It just depends on what your needs are. Now, a nurse may come to check you for blood pressure, do a full skin check. It just depends on what your needs are, you know, and they communicate with your doctors, they communicate with your family and, and give the understanding of where we are at in the process and give you support. That's what they're there for. The primary care doctor, I already talked about this, can still be a part of the hospice team if you choose to. Hospice is not about giving up. It's about living in comfort and dignity for the time one has left. I've had this conversation with people many times over the years. They're like, I'm not doing hospice because that means, that means as soon as I sign the paperwork, I'm going to die. I'm like, no, it does not. <laughs> I remember talking about that with my dad even. I mean, it's like, no, it, it's going to bring. And he, once he got to meet the nurse and the social worker and everybody and the aides that came, he loved it. It's not about that. I loved for myself personally, I love the counselor because if I didn't have her, <laughs> I didn't know how I was gonna make it to be honest with you. But it's support for the family, it's support for everyone. 
And I can't say, it, it depends on the, on the situation, if it's the right thing for you or not. Um, and as for which hospice company, I don't vouch for any, I'm not here to speak on any behalf of any hospice company. I work with all the hospice companies. So um, I think they all do a wonderful job. Does anybody have any questions? I'm the one doing a lot of talking. I want to see if anybody else has what to say. Yes. Then it does, yeah, then I think it extends. They ch they've changed it over the years, yeah. They should be letting you know when they do that. Yeah. You mentioned hospice companies. There are, just, mm -hmm. are there palliative care companies? Yes. Yeah, there are separate palliative care companies, and there's also some of the hospice companies have palliative care in their hospice companies. I, I, I don't have a list of anything with me today because I don't want to tell you the wrong anything. <laughs> but my, my recommendation is to, you know, if you are thinking about that, is to talk to your doctor about that. Um, or you know, if that comes up, you know, it's having that open communication is huge. Or you know, that's it's important. You were asking a question. You talked about palliative care doctors working with a bunch of the other specialists. Yes. Care. What, how much authority or how much ability to palliative care do palliative care nurses have with plugging into the other specialists to, to help? Do they ever partner? Are there, there are palliative care nurses? Not, I mean, they work with the doctor in the offices, and I know some of them will go to the homes. I mean, I don't know, power-wise, I don't know how, I mean, they all work together is what, I mean, that's the point of the whole system and how they work. I mean, the whole concept is comfort, pain, relief. Um, it's just trying, I mean, that's what I'm trying to convey today is just so everybody knows that these services are out there um, we live in a society, uh, and the genera a lot of the generation, <laughs> the people don't ask for help. I mean, I have patients that will tell me, oh, I just deal with it. And then I'm like, well, I'm calling the doctor. <laughs> so, because they're not getting the services that they need. They don't want hospice. And I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. We don't want to do hospice. Then we need to do something to treat these symptoms. Because they're only going to get worse, or they're going to exacerbate into something else. So we need to do something. We need to talk about this. So, um, and that goes for dementia, that goes for any, that goes with any progressive illness, Parkinson's, anything. Where do I start? What do I do? So if you know someone, I know somebody brought this up before, um, or someone with chronic illness or disease, talk about it. Um, communication is key. It is so important to talk about these things. A lot of people don't wanna talk about it. Um, reviewing advanced directives is huge. I've done talks about advanced directives many times in the past. A lot of people, like, I don't, I don't know where my, I think I have a living will. I think I have advanced directives. Make sure you know what your wishes are and your advanced directives are and talk to your family about these wishes. If there are no directives, I put on there, Tennessee.gov. I just shared this with a new, um, some folks I met recently. They, they have no directives. They both have multitude of medical problems. Neither one of them had advanced directives. And I sent them the Tennessee.gov because they have healthcare directives on there you can fill out. You just need some witnesses and you can fill out to do an advanced directive because We've seen it over the years where things happen quickly and you have no control over it. So you need to have your wishes down and in place, review them. Some of us haven't reviewed our wishes in quite a while, <laughs> but when you're talking about a serious illness or a serious condition that's progressive, we don't know what tomorrow may bring. So thinking about those things is very important. If you know someone or someone with a chronic illness or disease, speak speak to your doctor or speak to have, encourage them to speak to their doctor honestly about their symptoms. I, I name a few things here, um, pain, insomnia, constipation, loss of appetite, neuropathy. There's so many symptoms out there. I, 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 I know you all have so many other things 
discussing the illness, treatment options, directives, wishes, next steps, you know, those are so important. Talking to your doctor openly about your wishes, um, long-term planning, what to do for yourself or your loved one is so important. Communication is very important. So this, I hope this helped you all better to understand a little bit about what hospice, I mean, what hospice is. I mean, I know a lot of people have assumptions. Oh gosh, I don't want to do hospice. This, this means we're at the end. Not, not necessarily mean we're at the end. I mean, we've, I had a patient we put on hospice and she's perked up because she's getting more attention. We've changed, we've, the nurse and the doctor have looked at her meds. There were some meds she was on that she did not need to be on. She's perked up, she's gotten more attention, she's up more. It just depends on the situation. Palliative care, this, you know, I've had patients go on palliative care and I'm like, your pain's being addressed, hallelujah. Like, wow, like <laughs> we need to do something. Whether you do either one of them, that's okay. I mean, the main thing I, I feel is for our country, people need to take care of themselves and to take care of each other <laughs> and look at our directives you know, talk about what is best for ourselves and for our loved ones and, and, and just be there for one another. So um, if anybody has any questions, please, um, I'll stick around afterwards. Um, this is all I know how to do, y'all. So this is, <laughs> this is what I do, um, just this one topic. Yes, ma'am. If they, if my mother has improved at some point in time and they say, well, she doesn't need to be on hospice, Mm -hmm. I would talk to them about palliative care. I don't know which hospice you're using, but you, um, I would talk to them about that um, because I'm not sure where, you know, where she's at with her staging and everything. Because we've had patients, like I have a lady, I know I've had a lady, she came off hospice because they're like, well, she's on dementia, she has dementia. And they're like, well, because the criteria for dementia is kind of, you know, they're like, well, she's, she hasn't lost any weight. She's pretty stable. She actually gained weight. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, well, she's walking around a little bit better. And I'm like, she is declining. You know, so it's kind of like that criteria is so, you know, I wish it would be a little bit better, but she could always go back on it again. But I mean, I would ask them, ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. That's what I always, you know, I remember with my sisters when, because they were in Ohio with my parents on hospice, I'm like, always ask questions. Don't be afraid. Just, so, you're welcome. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. I think I'm confused on <clears throat> the palliative doctor. I have a, a relative who's on, who's actually with a pain management specialist. Oh, okay. So how, uh, how do we know if they need to, to leave them to go to palliative care? Or they work together or? I would talk to, does he have a primary care doctor or yeah. maybe talk to him about it? Cause he may be, he's only addressing the pain. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else going on. Is there a chronic illness or is it just chronic pain or is it? Um, chronic back. back, okay. Yeah, I would talk to the doctor and see, cause, I mean, I don't know all his backstory, but I would talk to his primary care doctor and see, just mention it to him. I mean, he may not feel that he's appropriate for palliative care. I don't know. I mean, it, it just depends on his situation. I just wonder what the palliative care doctor would do with the pain doctor. Well, they look at the whole person. They're not, not just focusing on just that back. They're not just focusing on that chronic pain in the back. So if that explains a little bit better, they're kind of looking at the whole thing. Cause like when my lady went to palliative care, she was like, well, you're just helping me for, for this. And she's like, no ma'am, we're looking at all of you. <laughs> and she was like, oh, well then that just opened up a whole book. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, but it may not be for, I mean, maybe it may not be for him. It just depends. So thank you all so much. And if you need to talk to me afterwards, I'll stick around. I've got, yep, yeah, over here. Thank you.